1 Corinthians chapter 14 speaks of prophecy. And uh, God loves to speak to his people by encouraging them, edifying them, and by exhorting them. And I feel like the Lord has a word for a couple of people before we get into this, you know, Caucasian. I just like skin. Come. This lady here. Can I minister to you? Come here, honey. Come on, lift your hands. Just worship him for a moment. We're just going, this is called body to body ministry. The priest's word is amazing and I'm going to preach, but the Lord wants to heal some people. Would you come here? What's your name? Let me tell you what the Lord began to speak to me today. He said that he brought you here today to do some serious heart surgery in the spirit. And there's been weights surrounding your heart. And it's almost like a weightiness. I don't know who invited you here today, but I'm telling you, it was the Lord Jesus that used them to get you here. And Jesus is going in and doing what no man or woman could do. You know, oftentimes we're seeking for assistance and help through earthly relationships in expecting them to fill voids that only God can fill. The Lord said that he's about to fill some God-sized voids in your life today. And he's going to heal you and, um, and he's going to begin to deal with, I'm talking about past stuff from like the past seven years. And in one moment's time, Jesus is just about to totally take that from you. Yeah, he's going to heal you. And uh, the sting of the memories is what's about to leave. The sting of the memories is what's about to leave. The Bible gives us instruction that if there be anyone sick among us, to lay hands on them. Are you okay with me laying hands on you? Father, I thank you for what you're doing for this dear sister. Thank you. Wow. Jesus. Precious Lord, touch your daughter today. Let the, uh -huh. Let the affirmation of Father God come upon her life. Let her sense and feel, God, that you're for her in every single area and the healing of her heart. Thank you, Lord God, that you're breaking off all levels of condemnation that hell would try to bring. And any kind of spirit that would want to make her feel that she's unworthy of you, your cause, your call, and what you've designed her to do. Anything that would make her feel that she's outside of your graces. We just break the power of that thing now. And we thank you, Lord, for that healing grace and power coming upon her in Jesus' holy name. Bless you, honey. Somebody just give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is doing so much around the room. Please keep playing what you're playing. And I want to be very sensitive to him, but I have to get this word to you. I want you to get your Bibles to Romans 15, verse number 7. Romans 15, verse number 7. Anybody have Kevin in your name at any level or you're a close relationship to a Kevin? a lot of hands going up, but is there a specific Kevin here, first of all, in your name anywhere? Okay. Everybody who's in close relationship with a Kevin, just stand. Just stand. Okay. But no one's name, Kevin, specifically here. Nowhere in your name. Okay. While those individuals are standing, I just want everybody to stretch your hands towards them. Father, I thank you right now that Lord, whoever Kevin is in their lives, that Lord, you're bringing restoration and you're bringing hope to Kevin. For those who are like, what's going on? It's called a word of knowledge. That the Lord would speak a certain thing to me because he wants to do something specific in their lives. It's in 1 Corinthians. Father, I thank you so much. The Lord, you're transforming Kevin. If I were you all, I would take this word to Kevin. That even in the next 10 days, yes, one word can reach several people, by the way. In the next 10 days, Kevin is about to have an encounter with the Spirit of God that's about to revolutionize his life and transform him. And there's an awakening that's beginning to happen. Oh, yeah, that's beginning to happen in their lives where it's like 
they have been pressing in at one level, but God's about to bring that elevation to a whole nother space. And uh, uh, um, wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. Anthony, I think this is for your Kevin more specifically. Everybody just keep where you're going. I want you to take this message uh, 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 to this Kevin and, and tell him that the Lord is stirring up gifts and uh, and uh, stirring up, stirring up the, the grace and the power of God on the inside of him, and causing for him to literally step in. It's almost like an, an escalator where he's stepping into a new level that's going to raise him up to new places of fulfillment and power. And so we speak in Jesus' holy name, Father. Let this be so, and let it be done in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a hand, clap of praise. That's so sad. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. All right, Romans 15, verse number 7. We're going to spend some time. We'll do some work. Romans 15, verse number 7. If you're excited to be in the house of the Lord, somebody say, yes, I am. Romans 15, verse number 7. My name is Sherman. I am the apostle and uh, uh, co-lead pastor of this church, and I'm so excited that you are here in the house of the Lord today. If you're a first or second time guest, I add my voice to that of Kim Scott's and say that we're so excited that you came to worship with us today. You could have chosen a number of places to go, but we're so happy that you're here, um, and uh, we believe that God's going to do something special for you. Romans 5, and 15 and 7. 15 and 7. Are you there? Romans 15 and 7. The Bible says, therefore, receive one another. Just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I want to minister a message this afternoon entitled Connected. Connected. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Would you help me thank God for our worship team and the musicians? And, uh, and, uh, let's thank God for Dr. Jaquette that led us so powerfully this morning in, in our time of soaking in prayer. Romans 15, verse 7. We have been... Um, in this series, this makes week number five, where we've been taking a journey through the book of Romans. Um, the Lord has been giving us revelation concerning grace, giving us revelation concerning uh, the, the fact that we have no condemnation. God has called us not guilty. We've been taking a journey in understanding the power of God's love towards his children, that we don't have to pay for sin he already paid for. In a land where the spirit of religion wants to live so loudly and wants us to be stuck in man's routine and ways of doing things. Through the book of Romans, God has awakened us to the fact that he is not pointing his finger at us going like this. But a matter of fact, his arms are open wide to every one of his children. And that he's willing to receive us. And to think about him and his love, his love is unconditional. I wish I had a church. His love was, is unconditional. His love has no conditions on it. Whereas men and women, you have to do something oftentimes for them to love you. And if you do something different from what they want you to do, oftentimes you can't find their love. I wish I had church. Uh, you know, you, you, if, if, I don't, if I switch up a little bit, I mean, and I start wearing lashes, then you think I'm too good for myself, you know, for you. And then you start talking about me because I added in the lashes. Glory to God. And, uh, and got them filled in real nice. Somebody say amen. And so because you became jealous because my lashes are better than yours, then you started feeling like uh, as if you would not love me anymore. I know that sounds funny, but some of y'all that petty. Uh, uh, it's important that you realize that God's love is real. Please say that to somebody next to you on your left, on your right. God's love is real. Yeah, I love that. Would you find somebody else and tell them God's love is real? It's, love, it's unconditional. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He loves me in spite of my crazy. Huh? I said he loves me no matter how nuts I really am. Ah, find somebody else around you. Say, you know you're crazy. You know you're crazy. He loves me in spite. You preaching already, sir. He loves me in spite of me. What a journey we've been in in the book of Romans. And this thing has come alive to us in a fresh way. And I think this series will go down in the books of one of our greatest series that have broken through in the lives of God's people. To understand the love and the grace and the power of not just the cross, but the power of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know it's not Easter yet, but there's still something powerful in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here in Romans chapter 15, verse number 7, 
Paul, again, is writing to his spiritual children, um, the church in Rome. And we are seeing now a bird's eye view, if you will, of a letter of an apostle to the people he's called to. Gives them an instruction here in Romans 15 and 7, and this is what he tells them. He says, listen, I want you to receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I love this because Paul is giving instruction of how we ought to handle one another. Notice that Paul did not begin these verses by just saying, receive them. Um, he didn't give you the instruction to make up your own way of receiving one another. You don't get to decide how you receive them. You don't get to decide who you will receive and who you won't receive. Yes, you have decision. Of course, you have the power of choice. But by way of the instructions that he is giving here today, you ought to receive one another. Look at this, please. Just as Christ has received you. Now, I need you to realize this today. Christ receives you and all of your junk. That's something I've been pressing into, and more than ever, I have it on my life, but I've been asking God for it more. Here's a word. Here's a word. I'm going to cut you out. You ready? Long-suffering. When you think about Christ really receiving you, I need you to understand how long he's been suffering with you. Y'all want to act like y'all got it together, but I see you just clearly as God's prophet. You messed up all over this building, the left, the right, and the center. Y'all are messed up, and you better be happy that God suffers long. Look at somebody next to you and say, the man suffers long with you. So where do we get off in relationship building where we've been creating our own limits and our own standards of how long we'll suffer? You ain't got to say amen. I'm coming for you today. Yes, I am. Uh, you've made a decision how long you're going to put up with X, Y, and Z. And oftentimes we've done this without talking to Christ. I'm not telling you you got to put up with everything forever. There are things that God will tell you to walk away from. Scriptures even talk to the apostles and they say, hey, you're going to go into some towns and if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go about your business. So there are moments where God says, excuse yourself and take the exit. I understand that. But you are not the one to be able to make that decision without conferring with God Almighty. Hello. See, the people that don't have no prayer life can't say amen because you don't understand communication with God. And you're looking at me like now like I'm talking Spanish. Well, no, we, we speak Spanish around here. So uh, like, I'm, like, I, like I'm talking, uh, give me some language. Whatever y'all said. So y'all got to understand. That God said, you need to confer with me concerning your connections. How long these connections last and what to do with the connections in your life. Good God Almighty. Listen to me. Something that you, you need to write down today because it's very important. Relationships are the economy of the kingdom of God. Relationships. Relationships. This is why. Good God. The enemy wants to work so hard for you to have horrible relational, horrible relational life. I mean, you, I mean, you can't keep a friend worth nothing. You change friends like you should change your draws. Notice the word true, should. Good God Almighty. You change friends so frequently that you don't understand what it looks like to stay in with a thing. Stay in with the person. My wife said something some months ago. She said, why can't we just all grow old with one another? Just listen to what she's saying. What she's saying is, why can't we have lasting power? Uh, in relationships. And I'm not saying that you should stay in everything. Trust me. When people start abusing you, get up out of there, man. You don't ever have to pray about abuse. Some of y'all so religious, you know, I got to see what the Lord said. That man just smacked you in your face. What the Lord? The Lord, let me tell you what the Lord said. Get out. Some of y'all don't like that. Because you either the slapper or the one that unfortunately is still holding on to the slapper. But I said, get out. And even if God wants to restore a thing, let him restore it without me sitting up in here with you slapping. 
I'm telling you, give up on your marriage. I said, walk out the door. And if somebody's willing to go through restoration, maybe I can walk back in. But as long as you're trying to make an excuse, it's in the room. As long as you're trying to make an excuse for your slapperization, I made up a word. As long as you want to make an excuse for acting a fool with me. And if you can't go and see a counselor and stay in counseling and get some restoration, there goes my exit. And I'm walking out the door. Abuse. I don't ever have to deal with abuse. So I don't need you to think when I'm talking about connections, I'm not excusing abusers at all. You understand me? You don't have to sit at the table with your abusers. These dysfunctional urban families and suburban families. Or you sitting at Thanksgiving dinner with the abuser sitting across from you and never talked about the situation before. You sitting there in distress, reliving the circumstance when that fool walked in your room and they got you making you feel like we are family, so you gotta do. No, I don't have to deal with this. And as long as you wanna keep that fool at the dinner table and he ain't repented or dealt with that situation, I ain't coming to Thanksgiving. Come out of that dysfunctional living. never have to pray about abuse. I don't got to pray about that. I don't, pray, I don't have to pray about an abusive church relationship. Pastors that don't care about you are abusing you. Y'all didn't like what I said to you. If you're not giving me proper care, or if you haven't set up a system, now I'm talking about systems, amen? Because I'm not sitting down with all, you know, five, six hundred of y'all. Praise the Lord. It ain't happening. God bless you. But I have set up systems by which if you need anything at this church, skip your tail over to that information center and we will serve you as best we can. But if you're in a church and you know somebody is not feeding you correctly, neglect is abuse. I'm working. And you've got to make sure that you don't stay in those situations. I just need to get that out of the way because sometimes when we start talking about long suffering, y'all think that means stay in with someone who's abusing you. And that's not the case. Somebody say preach apostle. Thank you. So relationships are the economy of the kingdom. If you want to go to the next level, many of the things that you will receive in life, you will not receive outside of proper relationships. This is why the enemy wants you to give up on relationships real fast. Somebody says one cross word to you. I don't want to be connected to you anymore. Somebody has one bad day. I don't want to be connected to you. I mean, these people, just like they did Jesus, they do it to me. I tell you, I mean, one day to be like, oh, my God, best apostle on the planet. I love you so much. I love you, love you, love you. The next day, correct them. They're going to take their exit. Why? Because people's love is conditional. They yelled, they loved, they, they, were, they were yelling to Jesus. They were yelling, oh, man, it's Messiah! Messiah! Next thing you know, crucify him. You've got to make a decision, though, that you're going to protect your relational capital. Even you can't get your harvest without a connection. Give. And shall be given to you what? Good measure. Uh-huh. Shaking it and running over. Show what? Men, you can't get your harvest without me, fool. You think that you're going to disconnect God from the body? You can't even get your connection, your relationship from uh, your harvest without the proper relationship. God ain't dropping manna out the sky no more. This stuff is coming through a connection. That's why I got to manage my connections at another level. I see I'm on a bunch of y'all toes because y'all looking at me like pull out of there. But I ain't pulling out. Therefore, Receive one another. Romans 15, 7. Just as Christ also received us. 
So I need, you to, I need you to watch this. For those of you who feel like I have to know you for years before I establish a connection, you're not actually following scripture. He gives no time limits on how fast you should move inside of a relationship or connection. Uh, then, then he says, receive them. Did, did he give any stipulations on receiving you? <laughs> Y'all are sick of me. <laughs> Has he told you, you know what, you know, I want you to get it together before you come to me. No. No. He receives you just as you are. So it's important that you begin to handle every relationship that God sends you with the next level mentality. Let's skip over to Romans 16. Thank you. Romans 16. Romans 16 contains kind of like an honor roll. Um, it's a list of 24 people whom Paul greets or talks about, complimenting them and honoring who they've been as a connection to him. I think this is very interesting that after Paul teaches about honor, teaches about grace, and teaches about the power of, of, of God's uh, resurrection and how he brings you out of a thing, that condemnation comes off of you. When he begins to teach you about the power of the revelation of what you've stepped into because of the blood of Jesus, he ends this with relationships. Why? Because after you have received grace, you cannot step into your next level without the right relationship. Okay. <laughs> Write this down. Some people are ushers to your next level. I believe you can't go to your next level without a proper usher. I'm not talking about some of y'all went back to the Baptist churches you came out of, the Kojic churches you came out of, traditional churches you came out with that mean usher with the white glove at the door. I'm not talking about her. I'm not talking about her, her, her usher walk. I'm not talking about none of that. They march. I ain't talking about none of that. Usher is someone who brings you to the proper seat. Paul told Timothy, hey, I don't want you to forget what you receive by the laying on and by prophecy. He began to talk about what his grandmother Eunice prayed for and brought him into. What was Paul trying to tell Timothy? You got here because of a relationship. Timothy, you didn't just arrive here. See, some of y'all so full of yourself, you think you got here by yourself. Uh huh. But the right relationship, the people, right people around you. Some of you are the product of a grandma Eunice. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Who was praying for you like Eunice was praying for Timothy? The only reason why your butt is still alive, because your grandmother didn't give up on you and laid down on her face and cried out for her grandchildren. You're here because of a connection. So he, said, he says, listen, he says in Romans 16, you can go there, verse 1, guys. But Romans 16, verse 1, he starts giving this whole list of people that he's been in relationship with. But one of the things that's important for you to find, verse 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. In every one of those verses, Paul gives something very specific about their connection. He says this. He says that, that these relationships or connections, catch this, in Christ. Listen to me. They are connections in Christ. As he begins to listen, I'm going to give you it again. Verse 2, study for yourself. 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. These relationships were grounded in Christ. All right, let's do some work. Grounded in Christ. Now, let's talk about this. Are we supposed to uh, uh, connect with people of the world? Yes. Do not listen to religious people that tell you no. Stop treating the world like they got cooties. You five seconds out the world, and then all of a sudden you... reach a world you would refuse to invade. So I'm not telling you that you can't go in and connect with people outside of Christ, but my founding relationships that are going to ground my life 
I don't go to a person that's full of hell that I'm ministering to, someone who is still yet on the outskirts of getting a revelation of Christ and ask them for their advice concerning my life in Christ. My life in Christ. Now, you, you, if you find you a rich unbeliever, you better go get everything you can. The Bible says the wealth, y'all don't, y'all don't want this word. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And some of you think that it's just going to drop on you. Nah, man. You got to have lunch with the wicked. You understand me? I told the Lord two years ago, give me lunch and dinner with the most wicked people you can find. I want the revelation of how to operate in the world system. I can get from the world. Listen, listen, write it down. If I want to learn how to operate in the world system, I can learn it from people in the world. But when it comes down to living this life in Christ, I got to have people connected to me, prophetess Pepta, who are grounded in Christ. That means that not everybody in the church, I'm appreciated anyhow, are people that are grounded in Christ. That there are people, I've been in church all my life, and there's people that's sitting in pews around the world who don't know nothing about Christ. Glory to God. So I've got to be careful to investigate the fruit of your life. If I'm going to listen to your direction, don't mean I can't sit in church next to you. Don't mean I can't worship with you but if I'm going to build a bond if I'm going to grow with you I've got to check the fruit of your life to make sure it lines up with the word of God because the word is Christ and the Christ is word and i got to understand that you are lining up with the word of God in order for me to build together how am I going to build in Christ and some of you are building relationships with people that have no fruit but according to Paul if you're going to build these relationships, they got to be in Christ. Uh, somebody say, preach apostle. I will. He starts in uh, Romans 16, verse 1. Give that to me on the screen. Romans 16, verse 1. Turn this. Romans 16, verse 1. Let's start looking at these relationships. I told you that there were 24. Somebody say 24. I'm not going to read through all of them. I don't have time. I don't want to. Uh, but there are some people. <laughs> How about that? Uh, there are a few people that I'm going to highlight to you that Paul was in relationship for, with. And the first one I want to talk about is this girl, Phoebe. And uh, he starts off by saying, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister. I love this. Who is a servant of the church in Centria. Listen to me. Why is that word servant important? I want you to write this down. The word servant is the Greek word diakonos. And that Greek word diakonos connects to your English word deacon. Uh, This woman, Phoebe, was not just any old kind of woman. She was a deacon in the Lord's church. She was a servant in the Lord's church. This, this really is important for you to understand this because for every man that makes the decision that you're going to do ministry without the women, you are in falsehood. Interesting enough that when Paul started listing the people that were connected with him, he didn't holler for his bros. But he starts off the list with his sister. Y'all don't want to get free. I think the communication here is that in the kingdom, there is no male or female. I wish you were here. Ah, I could feel that demon looking at me in here today. You don't like that. Because some of you men think that you are bigger and badder because you have a penis. I said it. You think that you are bigger and badder because of the anatomy that you have on your body. But I want to let you know something real quick. That just means that you have something to give different and that women have something to receive from you. But I want you to know at the end of the day, you're not the head of any woman except the one you married to. Shut your mouth, boy, thinking that you're in charge of some other woman because you're carrying a stick. Hello, I said it, a stick. That doesn't make you in charge. And some of you women been suppressed by men in the workplace, suppressed by men in your family, suppressed by men in the church. And you letting these idiots make you feel like you have no power and no authority. Paul starts off his list saying, let me tell you about my sister, Phoebe. He 
that she was a servant in the Lord's church. For those of you that think that Paul wrote scriptures that women should not be in leadership in God's house, you're confused. Or either Paul is, the man has to be schizophrenic. Because all of a sudden, you know, yeah, yeah, what about the scripture saying women be silent in the church? He was talking to a certain church and correcting them because they were speaking over their husbands. You letting them idiots in them traditional churches put women down at the bottom of the altar and won't let you get on the pulpit. You better run out of them prisons. God, I wish I was streaming. The world needs to hear this. It's so important that you understand that God is calling for men and women to walk together in unity to do the work of the Lord. And I need more of my fellas to say amen. I bind every misogynist demon on the inside of you that can't allow you to see the strength of a woman that we serve together. Be seated. I ain't done. I'm coming through a lot more. Uh, He's talking about his connection. Somebody say, get the right connection. Paul's like, let me list these folks out. He said, listen, listen, I'm not going to leave it like this. As I close the book, let me tell you who I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about Phoebe. What I love about Phoebe, watch her now. She was not just a woman, but she was a servant. She was a servant. And this is what the scripture says about people who operate as servants. They even the scripture begin to say, hey, that we need to bring on people to the team, and I paraphrase, that can handle the day-to-day things so that the apostles and the men of God can go up to the mountain to receive what God has for them, that they need people to handle, watch this please, the menial matters. Now, some of you, you're too prideful. So when you hear the word menial, you think that that should not involve you. God is looking for people like Phoebe in the house of God who don't mind doing the things that seem unimportant. Thank God for the men who stand at the gate and handle the parking lot. Y'all don't want this. Uh, Thank God for the men that walk ladies down to their cars to make sure that they get in there. Thank God for the men that mop the floors and clean the bath. Thank God for the men who are serving well in the house of God with what you would consider many of. Because the truth is, there was a day where I had to focus on cleaning the toilet and preaching the word. And so the church didn't get the fullness of me because uh, me and Dr. Kett was exchanging ourselves behind the signboard. Thank God for people that serve on the sound. Why? Because if the sound ain't right, y'all ain't saying nothing. It's going to pull us all out of glory. If I'm worrying about my car getting broken in while I'm in church, uh, I can't barely focus. We in San Bernardino. Hello. I need people that will handle menial things. And the Bible said, let the greatest among you be a Get low dog on it with your old prideful self uh, that has to have your name called, uh, that has to be on a list, uh, that has to be in a place where you in announcements, uh, that has to be in a place where somebody, if nobody ever calls my name, God will bring me to a place of fulfillment uh, or what he called me to do. My job is to serve. Point your finger at somebody and say, start serving dog on it. From the age of 12, something dropped inside of me for serving God's people. Can I tell you a story? Don't be rude. Uh, I served a man some years ago. When I was 13 years old, preached at the church where I was growing up. And I served this man as he was preaching in our church. Uh, Can I say this? Yes. Uh, his, his His spouse was very rude to me in my service and treated me like I was nothing. But I served anyhow because the Lord was teaching me something. Fast forward, 2019, I get a phone call from a friend that I'm building relationship with. And he said, do you ever know so-and-so? I said, yeah, I know them. I said, you know, I served them when I was a teenager one time in a preaching engagement where he was preaching at my home church. made me feel horrible, family. He said, yeah, you know him. Um, He wants to bring you all the way to a foreign nation and spend three days in pouring into your wife and yourself. He wants to 
give you a pretty much all expense paid trip. And you're going to stay at the top resort in his country. And you're going to be taken care of in the brand new way. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because if you go around serving, thinking that is nothing, you're going to miss out on the revelation that whom I serve, I can receive from. I know it's in the Bible. Bring a prophet a cup of water in the name of a prophet and you shall receive. Y'all don't want this. A prophet's reward. It matters who you serve. That's why I'm not just going to serve at any old church. That's why I'm not just going to serve in any old movement. I got to serve the right person because I don't want a reward from everybody's anointing. I need the right mantle. I need the right man. I need the right woman. That's why some of y'all became too common with this house. I'm coming for you. And you've missed out on the fact that God put you in a place to serve two of the greatest leaders on the planet. And you've got to understand that you ought to serve well. Because when you receive and you give a prophet a cup of water in the name of a prophet, you are due the reward. I mean, I almost might as well stay at Phoebe. You, you just got to learn how to serve. Be seated, please. Gotta learn how to serve. And you can't let uh, prideful people talk you out of your serving. Family members that don't bail and know God. You still over there up at that church? You been there all day and you still there? How long you gonna be there? I mean, you gotta come home at some point. You gotta eat. I mean, we all gotta eat. That's what got you in problem. You've been eating so much, you don't do nothing but eat, fool. I don't need you to worry about my lunch. Worry about your diet. Let me move. Somebody say Phoebe. Phoebe. Phoebe is also important because many theologians believe that Phoebe was the one who carried the letter to the church of Rome from Corinth. So listen to me. There are people that God is raising up like Phoebe who are carriers of the message. Good God Almighty. God is looking for Phoebes who will carry the message that God released through his apostles. Ah, it may not be a letter right now, but it just may be a social media post. I want y'all to catch this. It, 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 may, it, may be, it may be the word of mouth, but God is raising up a house of Phoebes who will take the message that was established in the house of God and carry it to the people that need it. Look at somebody and tell them, get a Phoebe anointing, please. Get a Phoebe anointing. Verse 3 got to go home. Verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. These are my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Oh, God help me. Workers. Workers. The harvest is plentiful. But the problem we got, we can't find no workers. Uh, the harvest is ready to be received. Harvest doesn't come to you. You got to go to harvest. I, I, that just has so much in it. And I wish I could lean in it, but I don't have much time. Y'all want to go home and have some chicken. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go and finish this message. It, it's important that you understand that's the reason why some of you don't have your harvest is because you're waiting on it. And some, the, the reason why some of you are still not living in harvest is because you've been waiting for the harvest to come to you. But I heard the Spirit of God tell me to tell you this afternoon that it's time for you to go and get your harvest. Wherever I have sown, I'm going to start gathering, doggone it. Look at your neighbor say, get you a basket and get your harvest. Go somewhere and find what belongs to you. I'm no longer going to sit at a place waiting for you to bring, for you to bring me what belongs to me. But I'm going to go and get what is mine. Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Look at this, please, verse 4. Who risked the text preaches for itself. I don't really have to say nothing. The, 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 he said that risk their own necks. 
from my life. Are we talking about the right connections today? You've got to find the kind of people, if you want to change the world, you need people that's going to rock with you that are willing to risk everything for you. Ooh. Ooh, see, how, see how you're checking your circle right now because you realize that everybody around you wants you, want you to risk your next, but a bunch of people around you are not willing to risk their next. The kind of people that I'm keeping close to me in this season are the type of people that I'm watching risk their neck. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And you can talk about who I'm talking to. You can talk about who I'm going to coffee with. You can talk about who's on my Insta stories. But the people you're going to see is the ones that's willing to risk their neck for the work of of the Lord, of you sitting there looking at me, expecting me to do all of the giving, and you're not willing to give anything. You don't belong in my circle. I'm looking for a Priscilla and an Aquila. Preach, Simon. Yes, sir. I'm looking for a Priscilla and an Aquila who are willing to risk their necks for me. Ready to take some risk. Sometimes it's risky to be in relationships with certain people. I'm controversial. If you're going to get connected to me, man, you're jumping. You're taking a risk, man. People are going to tell you you're connected to a warlock. People are going to tell you that I'm a leader of a cult. People will tell you all. Go around and ask people about all nations. And they'll tell you all kinds of lies. But I need the kind of people who are not willing to listen to the naysayers and the gangsayers. And say, I'll put my neck out here. I wish you would say something about my church. I'll kick your neck clean off. I wish you would say something about my leader. I need people around me that's willing to take a risk. I need you to check your circle real quick and do some evaluating in the Holy Ghost. Check your friends list. I can't hear you. I say check your friends list and see if you got people around you that's willing to risk their neck. But as soon as you do something crazy, they want to run from you. I need you to stand with me when I'm right and I need you to stand with me when I'm messed up. I need you to stand with me when I lost my mind and I need you to stand with me when my mind is... I need a risk taker. risk their own necks for my life. That's what kind of church we are. We are a church of risk takers. We're a church of risk. We don't take a risk with your crazy self. Huh? I mean, you can leave this church a hundred times and we'd still be up here. Come on back home, baby. Good to see you. We love you. We knew it was temporary. Come on back. It's, it's good. We straight. No shame. No shame. I'm willing to take a risk. I'm willing to take a risk. I'm willing to take a risk on you. I'm willing to take a risk on you. We are the church that's willing to take a risk on you. We are the church that's willing to take a risk on you. We are the church that's willing to take a risk on you. We'll risk investing in you. We'll risk loving on you. We'll risk ministering to you. We'll risk standing with you. And we're not looking necessarily for my harvest to come from you. Because I don't reap where I sow. I reap what I sow. So not every place I sow is where my harvest is going to come from. I might sow over here and go over here and find my harvest. I got to get out of here. It's important that you find you. Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. He said, I'm not in this by myself. And it's not just a church at Rome. But there are other churches, watch this please, that have supported my ministry for me to become who I am. What is Paul promoting? He's promoting the intersection of streams. Some of you are going to find this. Some of you will get this. The interconnection of churches of diversity. And this is the hour where he is saying that it's important for the Baptists and the Pentecostal. It's important for the Kojic and the, and the Apostolic. It's important for the Catholic and the Episcopalian to stand in the same place and stand side by side. Paul said, I didn't get here by myself. He said, but there was a group of churches 
that supported me. That's what your church is pushing for in this hour. We're releasing a sound that says we can rock together. You may believe in tongues and the other may not believe in it. But as long as we believe in Jesus and him crucified, y'all ain't saying nothing, and that he rose on the third day, I can rock with you. Hello. I, you might call your church a little something different. You may do stuff a little different over here. We jump, we sit and soak, and we dance. Over at your church, all you might do is buck, but we can still hang out together. Somebody say, get the right connection. What's important for you to understand, thank you, ma'am, about these friends of Paul. I want to say something, and then I got to go. Priscilla and Aquila. They were at the forefront of ministry as a husband and a wife team. I want y'all to pay attention to me. All married people and all people who want to be married. Listen, it is important that you understand that God is highlighting in this hour men and women, husbands and wives, who are willing to be able to stand next to each other and do the work of the ministry together. Please notice that Paul did not just recognize Aquila, but please recognize that he recognized Priscilla as well. Please pay attention to the fact that he did not just glorify the husband and the work that he had done, but that he recognized that he had a wife that was standing right, not behind him, watch yourself, right next to him. Doing the work of the, I'm preaching good in here. Ladies that are looking to be married, find you a man that doesn't want to suppress you. But find you a man that's willing to lift you up. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Find you a man that's not, that's not wanting to shut you up and take, girl, be quiet. You talk too much. Find you a man that's able to say, you know what? You inspire me. You drive me. You push me. Why so quiet in here? Find you a man that's willing to stand by you. If husbands, if you married to a woman, are you connected to this church I bind that devil in you that want to shut your wife's mouth up uh, and don't tell me it's my house and I do what I want to if you do it you in violation of the Bible God ain't told you to shut your wife's mouth mm, coming for you it's vitally important tell them son it's vitally important that you understand that God has designated men and women to work together as teams I can't just marry anybody. I got to check and see if we can do team together. Because abs only last a while. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And after a while, things start drooping that used to be up. I can't hear nobody. After a while, stuff starts sagging that used to be high. I need more than a hot body. Y'all ain't saying nothing in here. I need to know if you got some depth in you. I need to know if when I'm going through, you can stand with me. I need to, hello, somebody. Choose no man because he got nice hair. And that's the only thing. Now, I don't want you to know about it ugly because ain't nothing worse than looking at a monster when you wake up in the morning. Don't get you no monster. But I'm saying you can have both. I, 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 and I know, so I'm going to deal with this real quick and I got to get out of here. Some, some of y'all, some of y'all, like, I, I don't think, I mean, I just feel like I just, you know, well, I mean, he's safe. I'll just take him. And you 10 years down the line looking at that thing with, with breath like a dragon in the morning and you. I might say Pr Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. It's vitally important that you understand that God wants to designate you to have teams around you. Amen. Somebody say teams. God wants husband and wife teams that will gather together and operate in ministry with one another. So he said, that's what I had with me. I had Priscilla and Aquila. Then he goes on, and I'm done. I'm about done. I promise. About done. First number seven. I ain't done. That's about done. Verse number seven. Yeah, that's it. First close. Here we go. He said, I want you, what kind of name is this? Greet Andronicus. Now, you know, Andronicus, that sounds like some name from the hood. Y'all ain't saying nothing like that. Y all, y all, why y'all trying to play me? That sounds like a name straight from the hood. Like, what's your name? Andronicus. 
That's what we call him. <laughs> Tron, Tron. Woo. Okay, I'm not paying him no attention. That's not who I'm talking about. But who I want to look at <laughs> is Junior. Now, there's an argument among theologians whether Junior was female or male. There are many theologians that believe that she was a woman. And I agree. Uh, Junia, my countrymen, listen here, and fellow prisoners. Uh, you, you, yeah, 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 yeah. This was not just any old Gotti. This was a ride or die. Like we went to jail together. How many of y'all remember in the world, y'all hung out with some people that you almost went to prison with. Some of y'all went to prison with them. But some of you almost went to, why y'all trying to play me in here? I know you're in here. You got some stuff that you was like, we almost got locked up. Do you know, there is stuff your pastor did back in the day that I thank God I never got caught. I was stealing people's credit cards as a teenager to rent limos to go to my wife's high school. I drove up to, uh, where you used to go to school? John Muir High School. I know. In a, in, in, in a town car. For a school assembly. I had vision for my future, y'all ain't saying nothing. From somebody's credit card I had stolen. I thank God I'm not in jail. Are y'all in here today? I know it's white collar, but I mean, still in this, still in things. I got to get out of here. My wife told me to wrap it up. Here we go. Junior. <laughs> it's for secret conversations. Y'all don't even be noticed. I walked over there. She's like, wrap it up, Reverend. You've been preaching for a while now. Wrap it up. <laughs> Junior. <laughs> it's kind of stuff be happening on the front row that y'all don't know about. She's like, okay, it's been enough. Let's get it done. Junior, <laughs> Junior <laughs> who are noted among the apostles. Pay attention. So many theologians believe that Junior was a female apostle that did the work of the Lord. I know I'm heavy on the women today, but I need you to understand that God is raising up people of all kinds of backgrounds whoever you are, to be able to succeed in the world that he has created. And we need some people who are willing to ride or die for us. You understand with me? That are willing to go. If we're going to jail, we're going to jail together. You understand what I'm saying? That we're going to stick together and we're going to make it happen, but we're going to do it together. Look at your neighbor and get real hood with it and be like, together. All right. Y'all play something softly. Let me get done with this. Verse number 17. Verse number 17. I'm almost done. Second close. Now I urge you, brethren, note those, pay attention to this, who cause divisions and offenses. Contrary. He said, listen, I've, done, I've taught you. I've taught you all 15 of these chapters. Uh, now I'm at chapter number 16. And as I close, I want you to watch yourself. And I want you to note those who try to cause divisions and offenses. Pay attention. Watch your surroundings. Because he says, listen, you got to be willing to protect the connection. The connections that God has released to me in my life, I've got to be willing to protect them at all costs. People that God has put around me because I'm not going to be successful alone. You need community. It's not possible to succeed by yourself. No, because even if you're succeeding in money, you're dying in soul. The only way you're going to be successful, if you let them walls down. Now I'm coming. Here it comes. You got to let them walls down. You got to be vulnerable. You got to be honest. You got to say, I'm about to not just rock. I'm about to rock in community, man. 
I'm not going to change the world by my. That's why the Lord brought you to a church like this, because he wanted to get you inside of a community. You can find any place to go to church. I mean, I mean, I give you a list. I mean, there's a bunch of places to go to church. Well, we got the special here. It's community. God wants you in the right community. And he says, pay attention to people who want to divide and bring offenses. He said, if it's contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, avoid them. I said, did the Bible just say that to me? It said, avoid them. If it's contrary, if it's contrary. Listen, and he's not talking about, again, your worldly connections. This message is to the church. And he's saying, inside of the church, there are people who want to bring divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Avoid them. Why? Why would I do that? I've got to protect the connection. What the Lord has opened up for me, I've got to protect it by any means necessary. Last thing, last close. You've got to protect your connections from yourself. Because sometimes the biggest threat against your connection is your mind activity. You'll start making up scenarios for stuff that nobody ever said to you. You people have whole conversation in their head with me. In their head. This is what he's going to say, and this is how he would say it. So I didn't come say nothing because I knew you was going, you don't know me, man. You can't have conversations in your head with people around you. You got to take those conversations out of your head, out of your heart, and say them out of your mouth. And build vulnerable and honest community. And you got to check yourself when you find yourself coming against the connections that God has given you. Just look at somebody and say, you need connections. <laughs>